Hello, today I'm going to explain this concept of happiness oriented testing. Um, just to manage your expectations, this talk is not going to be very prescriptive in the sense that I'm not going to tell you exactly what you need to do step by step. The goal of this talk is just to give you a different perspective of what quality is and also what's the role of a tester within a team. All right, so first things first, uh, my name is Diogo. I'm a QA and I've been a QA for quite a while now. And besides being a QA, I have way too many hobbies. And one of them is blogging, which is how this whole thing started. So I posted this on my blog um, with the same same topic, same, same, con same thing. And to my surprise, it was featured by not one, but two online software testing newsletters. And I thought to myself, well, my blog is not that popular and I didn't do any promotion. So for these newsletters to find my article and highlight it, it's probably because they saw some value in this and maybe what I'm proposing is not that weird or not that silly. So that's why I decided to create this talk to help spread the message. Okay, so before we go into the topic itself, we need to agree on a definition of quality. Um, there's plenty of definitions as usual, but I like this one because it's short and sweet. So it says that quality is value to someone who matters. So let's just take one minute to really understand this, this definition. The first part, it says it's value to someone, which kind of implies that it's subjective because different people will have different perceptions of value and different expectations as well. So first part of this quality definition, it is subjective. The second part is even less intuitive and it says someone who matters, which again implies that not everyone is equally important, which I know sounds harsh, but it's actually true. And I'm going to give you a simple example. If I, as the QA, say that this product has quality and then there's a user next to me that says the same product does not have quality, it's their opinion that matters. It's their view of quality that matters. And why is that? Because when we created this product, we created to solve a problem. We created to be used by some people, someone who matters. So that's why they are more important than me as a QA, because if they don't use the product that we created, then the product is useless. And it doesn't matter what product we build, what quality it has, it's a useless product, just stop. So that's why this someone who matters is very important because we always need to keep in mind who we are serving. Okay, so yep, that's it, quality. I really like this definition because it seems simple, yet it's so powerful and it has these two um, important aspects of quality that I, I don't think it's intuitive to everyone. Okay, so now we know what quality is. Uh, next step is to measure quality so that we can improve it. So how do we do that? Well, there's plenty of traditional metrics. I'm going to give you a few examples and then I'm going to give you my opinion on how well they measure quality. So let's start with an easy one. Uh, counting the number of bugs as a measurement of quality. So let's say, let me get out of the way. Let's say that we use this metric to measure our quality and we found zero bugs. Does that mean that we have a quality product? Yes, no, maybe. So for me, it's a maybe because maybe your product is perfect and there's no defects, or maybe you're really, really bad at finding bugs. You don't know. You can't be sure it's one or the other. So, okay, let's do another exercise, still with the same metric. Let's say that we are good at finding bugs. Actually, we found a hundred bugs and we fixed them. So does our product have quality? Yes, no, maybe. To me, it's still a maybe because your product might be like this picture or this park. So what you have done is you cleared the park, you cleared all the garbage in all those places, but you missed a spot. And unlucky for you, 
that's the spot where the people want to be. Maybe there's a playground or some park benches or whatever. It's the part that adds value to someone who matters. So what this means is that even though you had all these efforts, you didn't solve the problem or you didn't add value to the people who matter. So all that effort was for nothing and your quality didn't really improve after you spent all this effort. So it seems that using this metric is not that good to measure quality. Okay, let's try a different one. Testing coverage. Uh, very popular, lots of people use it. Uh, it, should be, it should be a good one, right? Let's see. So let's do the same exercise. Let's say that we have um, a small number, like 20% test coverage. Does that necessarily mean that it's a bad quality product just because the number is, is low? So before I answer that, um, just to remind ourselves what testing coverage is, this is just um, a measurement that tells you how much of your product or your software excuse me, how much of your product was automatically tested at least once. That's what testing coverage means. It doesn't say anything about quality. So when we have 20%, a small number like 20%, it's just telling you that of the whole product, you tested automatically at least once, 20% of it. Now, is that necessarily bad? To me, it's not necessarily bad. It just means that maybe you had to prioritize um, time is limited and resources are limited and you have to make a choice. You can test the whole thing, so you need to prioritize. So maybe that 20% is just you choosing the 20% of your product that must work at all times, otherwise some catastrophe happens and you need to issue refunds or whatever, something really bad happens. Or maybe you use the 80-20 rule to test 20% of the features that are used by the vast majority of your users, like 80% of your users, the people who matter. So to me, having a small number in testing coverage is not immediately or necessarily a bad thing. Okay, let's do the other way around then. Let's say that you wake up one day and you are living in Mars, the world is perfect, cars are flying, there's no wars, no famine, no nothing, and your testing coverage is 100%, like this perfect world. Does that mean that your product has quality? Yes, no, maybe. To me, at best, it's still a maybe. And the reason for that is because, again, testing coverage doesn't tell you anything about the quality or the value that you are delivering to the user. So potentially, what might happen is if you only focus on testing coverage and ignore the value that you deliver to the user, you might end up with a perfectly tested useless software that's it like a perfectly tested useless product to me that's like the worst waste of all because not only you waste the time developing a product that is useless and then on top of that you spent even more efforts perfectly testing something that is garbage nobody will will use it because it's a useless product it doesn't add value to the user um yeah let, oh, i was in front of the picture, sorry. Um, so yeah, so to me, testing coverage, the number of the testing coverage doesn't tell me much about the quality that we are delivering to the user or the quality of our product. Okay, let's try a different one. Um, there's this popular book um, called Accelerate, which preaches these four metrics like deployment frequency, mean time to recovery, and so on. Um, the big boys are using it, like Amazon, Facebook, whatever. Uh, we want to be good like them, so we should just copy them and use the same tools, right? Again, uh, if we use these metrics, they don't tell us much about quality. If you understand them, they are very focused on delivery and the um, stability of your delivery. So if you only focus on improving these four metrics and ignore the rest and the quality that you deliver to the user, then you might be optimizing to deliver shit faster to the user, which is not what we want and it's certainly not what quality is about. So what I'm trying to tell you with all these examples is that if we use these traditional metrics, we're always going to have 
uh, distorted perspective of reality and a, a distorted perspective of quality and the quality that we're delivering to the users. And I can give you a simple analogy to illustrate my point. So we all know diets, uh, how they work and what they're useful for. Let's say that we want to be healthy. Uh, we want to have a healthy diet. So what do we do? We do some research and we found out that salmon, for example, um, is very healthy because it contains omega-3 or whatever. So what do you do? Um, salmon is healthy. I want to be healthy. Therefore, I'm going to eat salmon on every meal for the rest of my day, uh, for the rest of my life every day. Now, is that the healthy diet? Not really. Uh, it's maybe even worse than what you had before. So when going back to software, when we focus on a single metric, that's the same thing as always eating salmon every day, every meal. Um, if you want to have a quality diet, you need to use a range just the same way that with the diet, you need to use a range of products plus some water and exercise to be healthy. With software, it's the same thing. You need to combine a set of metrics, different metrics. And then on top of that, you add tools and development practices like pairing or code review, um, methodologies like doing retros after a certain amount of time to make sure that you are continuously improving, listening to customer feedback, um, monitoring our services and on our products uh, in production. You need to, just the same way that we had these ingredients in software, you need to find out what are the ingredients and you need to combine all of them. And together, you like to, only when you use all of them together, you'll get a quality diet. Otherwise, you're just focusing on a single thing and you are fooling yourself. Okay, so you might say, yeah, I know how diets work. Uh, it's way too much work and too many things for me to track on, uh, to track. And there's no way I can do that. Just give me one thing. If you give me one thing, then maybe I'll be able to do it. Like I told you, if we focus on a single metric, it's very likely that we're going to have this distorted perspective of reality. But I think there's one metric that we can use and even try to maximize without fooling ourselves. And I'm going to give you a minute to guess what that metric is. It should be fine. It should be easy. So as you might have guessed by now, that metric is happiness. I know it sounds cheesy uh, using this happiness as a metric and you might be thinking there's no way we can use that. That's so unprofessional using happiness. And besides, it's very subjective, like different people have different views uh, of what happiness is. And even if we wanted to, there's no way we can measure that because there's no formula for happiness. So how can we use that as a metric? Well, I'm glad you asked all those questions because I will now give you an answer. So unprofessional. Yes, it doesn't sound as professional as saying our mean time to recovery is seven minutes and 20 seconds, whatever. But as we saw before, these professional or traditional metrics are not the best to measure quality. So there's no problem there. And it's true that happiness is subjective, but you know what else is subjective? It's quality. Yes, as we have seen before in the definition, it's value to someone. So it is subjective and that's fine. And it's true that you don't have a mathematical formula to measure happiness, but that doesn't mean that you cannot measure it. Measuring happiness can be as simple as giving your product to a user, let them test it, interact with it, explore it. And then at the end you ask, are you happy with our product? How satisfied are you with our product in a scale of one to 10 or one to five? What, what did you feel while you were using our product? Were you happy? Were you excited? Uh, were you frustrated? Were you confused? Were you angry? Um, would you recommend our product to a friend or a family member? Would you pay for our product if the product was not free? Uh, how much are you willing to pay? Like 
all of these questions give you data points on the user satisfaction and how happy they are with the product and how happy they are with the value that we are delivering to them. So even though we don't have a formula, that doesn't mean that we cannot use it to uh, as a metric, especially happiness. And I think our industry, like computers and software, is the only industry where we can sell it just works as a feature because that doesn't work on any other industry. I, I'm going to give you a simple example or analogy. Let's say that you want to buy a car. So you go to the store and there will be a salesperson trying to sell the car by saying, buy this car. This car is amazing. It moves. And you're like, yeah, of course it moves. Why wouldn't it move? It's a car. It's made to move. Why would you sell me a car that doesn't move? It doesn't make any sense. Now, back to, excuse me, back to software. Um, we are so used to software that doesn't solve our problem or doesn't work the way we expect or has so many errors and you need to do these workarounds for it to work. You need to use this specific browser and this version and you install Java, otherwise it doesn't work. And thank God Flash is no longer a problem. Like we are so used to this broken experience that when something actually works, we're like, oh my God, did I, did I die and go to heaven? What's this? It, it did the thing. It solved my problem and I was able to use it by myself without asking for help. And it saved me time and oh my God, this is, please take my money. This is amazing. When in fact, we should have exactly the same reaction as the, as the car is like, yeah, of course it works. Of course this app works. Why wouldn't it work? Why would you release a software that doesn't work? Why would I pay for something that doesn't solve my problem or that is cumbersome to use? And I think one of the reasons why that happens is because we developers, testers, we that work in this, in the, in the technology industry, we like technology a lot. And I think we sometimes like it so much that we lose track of ourselves and we forget why technology exists in the, in, in the first place. So we have technology to solve problems. And we solve problems to serve someone, to serve people, to serve someone who matters, going back to the definition. So the same way that the Agile Manifesto, for example, puts people over processes, I think we need to keep in our minds to put people over tech. We have technology to solve a problem to serve someone. That's the main goal. The, te the technology itself or the software is not the end goal. It's just a means to achieve an end, which is to serve someone. And throughout this talk, I've been mentioning a lot uh, user and uh, customer and client and their satisfaction and their happiness. But my point is that, yes, that is important, but it, it is equally important to care about the happiness of your developers or your engineers what we call um, DevX in comparison to UX, which is user, user experience. Because when you have happy developers or engineers, they will care about the work that they're doing. And if you're lucky, they will have more empathy for the people that they are serving. Because when they are happy, it's more likely for them to have that empathy for the people who, that they are serving. And the difference is that you, you can actually measure the difference by the, um, the time that, that it goes between something being done and something being shipped. Because if they are happy, once something is done, they stop. They stop and they pause to ask themselves, am I happy with the thing that I built? Are our users going to be happy with the thing that I built? I don't know. Let me test it. And then they test it. They, again, if they have the empathy firmware, if they have the empathy chip, they turn it on and then they're going to test it as a user and they're going to use the product that they developed as the user would. And then one of two things will happen. Either they are happy and they ship it, that's fine. Or they will 
conclude that mm, actually if I was the one using this I wouldn't like this this would be frustrating or if my mother was using this she would have no patience for this this is way too slow she would not uh, she would get tired of this or if it was my grandpa uh, my uh, grandfather using this he he would be confused and he would need someone else to help him use this software I know how to use it because I build it and I know the tricks. I know how it works behind the scenes, but someone else would not have that context. This is not good enough. Let me improve this. That's, that's the difference. So when you have someone, um, a developer that is happy, they will care about this and then they only ship it when it's the best work that they can produce and the best software that they can build. Because if you don't have happy developers, then it's a whole different story. What happens is that they go to the to-do column to just pick something, pick a feature from there, hopefully the one from the top, the highest priority. And then they read the ticket, they read the acceptance criteria, if you're lucky, and then they implement the bare minimum for that to work, and then they ship it, they go home, and go do some something else so that they can forget this horrible, horrible work that they have. There's no way with an environment like this and with unhappy developers like this that you are going to achieve quality, that you are going to deliver the best product that you can or that you are going to add value to someone who matters. So to me, um, in order to reach quality, it's very important to keep both of these groups happy at the same time. That's that's the catch. You cannot focus on just one of them. If you focus on user um, user happiness and ignore your developers, then you are going to have these miserable developers building this horrible software and eventually you'll end up with a product that is not being maintained and it's full of bugs and it's unstable and eventually your users will say, I'm not going to use this. This is this. I, I don't have any confidence in this software or this software doesn't solve my problem. Drop it, trash can, garbage. If you do the other way around, it's also a problem. If you focus on developer experience and you ignore your users, then you are going to optimize for the technology. You are going to have these very happy developers tinkering with this new JavaScript framework and this architecture and design and microservices and monoliths and going back and forth through time. Meanwhile, your users are saying, hey, please, can I have something that solves my problem? This doesn't have any, any value to me. The last time you shipped a feature was one year ago. Why are you always redesigning this and it's the same value? This is the problem. When you focus only on developers and you forget your users, then you get a product that is tech bloated and it's just tech, no product, no value. So that's why it's important for you to care and improve the happiness of your users and care and improve the happiness of your developers. If you do this at the same time and you care about these two groups at the same time, equally important, then naturally you'll figure out whatever you need to have in place to please both of these groups and by doing so you will achieve quality. Achieving quality becomes like an indirect um, consequence of keeping these two groups happy. And just before we go, a quick um, takeaway that you can um, have from this talk is to ask yourself, does it spark joy? In the wise words of Marie Kondo, like, am I happy? And you ask this question throughout the development cycle when you are building your software am i happy with the way we develop software am i happy with the product or the feature that i just built am i happy with the way that we deliver and monitor this software to our users as a user am i happy with the product that i received if the answer is yes throughout the development cycle from all these groups then naturally you will have achieved quality. And just one last thing uh, before I go. If you notice, I've been talking about quality for more than 20 minutes already, and I've never mentioned the words tester or QA. 
The reason for that is because I believe I need to do a funny thing. Hey, um, the reason for that is because I think it's not the sole responsibility of a QA or a tester to care about quality or to care about our users. It's, it needs to be a, a joint effort. It's a team effort from everyone, from the tester that tests, from the developer who builds, from the product owner or manager who comes up with the concept of the product, from the customer support who lis listens to the difficulties and the frustrations from our users and comes back with feedback. It needs to be a team effort from all of those people. There's no way a single person can achieve that. That's why I don't like the, um, the term quality assurance because it's almost impossible to assure quality. We, as a QA or as a tester, we can advocate for quality. We can preach about it. We can support the team with that. We can give them tools, techniques. We can raise awareness for quality and for our users, but we cannot assure it because we don't control, as QAs, we don't control the variables that determine quality. And from my experience, I've been on teams where QAs were the only responsible, uh, the only people responsible for quality. It doesn't work. They quickly become a bottleneck and everything needs to have this seal of approval, the QA seal of approval, as if the QAs were some um, angels or some gifted people that have this special power of knowing if something is broken or not. Everyone can do that. Um, and the more people that test it, the better, because everyone will have their blind spots. And if everyone tests and it, if everyone contributes, then we're just adding uh, safety layers on top or safety nets one on top on top of the other it's like you can think of um, slices of cheese that have holes if you have a single slice of cheese it's going to have holes like a hole is like a risk or a problem a, pot a potential problem the more people that care about quality is the more slices of cheese that you start stacking to on top of each other so the more slices you have the less likely it is to have holes and the holes that you will have will, will be smaller so the risks that you have left are smaller and fewer. Um, that's if the QAs are the only people testing. I've been on teams with where the opposite happens. There's no QAs and engineers are responsible for quality and surely um, developers can test their own codes, right? This is usually the, the rationale. I don't agree with that. It doesn't work because like I said, people have their blind spots, especially if the if the if the author or the creator of the code needs to evaluate themselves and test themselves. It's it's never going to work. I I can give you a, another simple analogy. At school or university or whatever, there has been I'm sure there has been a point in your life where you wrote a test, uh, a text. Sorry, test testing. Uh, you wrote a text. And then you hand it over to someone else, like a friend or your mother, your, fa your father or whatever, and then ask, please review this text um, because I wrote it and I cannot review it. Everybody knows that that's how it works. We have been spending way too much time writing that text. Uh, we, know, we know the words, all the words that are there. There's no way we have, uh, we are unbiased evaluators of, of that text. It needs to be someone else without that bias, without that context that can, uh, with fresh eyes to review our, our thing. If that happens with something so simple as a, a text with words, it's even going to be more um, problematic with something as complex as code if you don't give it to someone else to test it or to review it. So yeah, Either way, I don't think it works. It needs to be, uh, the extremes don't work. It needs to be some balance in between. It needs to be a shared effort from all, all, of, the, all of the team. Okay, so that's what I wanted to share with you. Um, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. I'm available on my website. You have my contacts there or also in LinkedIn if you want. And I also have, uh, like I mentioned, a blog where I post frequently, not so frequent lately, but I try to. Uh, post about quality. So if you have any question or anything, just let me know. I hope this was useful to you and I'll see you on the next one.